Hello, and welcome to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, where we challenge, encourage, and equip Christian women just like you to be all in in faith and family. On today's podcast episode, I am talking with a friend of mine, Sheila Ray Gregoire, all about her brand new book, The Great Sex Rescue. If you grew up in the evangelical church, Over the last several decades, you may have been familiar and heard about the purity culture movement that was very popular over the last 10 to 20 years or so. Basically, that all boys want to have sex, that it's the girl's job to make sure that they don't, and everything that went along with that. I know that I was absolutely raised in this culture at the church that I went to. Well, while these messages were delivered with good intentions, unfortunately, they created a lot of problems after the fact that we are just now realizing how harmful some of these messages were. Not that we're saying that all people should go run around and have sex outside of marriage, but some of the ways that these messages were presented have had lasting negative effects on marriages today. So that's why I'm so excited to talk to Sheila about the research that she's done and the findings that she has shared in her latest book. And I hope that you find today's conversation very interesting and eye-opening, especially if you were someone who was raised in this culture as well. Also, if you are listening to this podcast near the time of its release, hopefully you have heard my brand new book, Fall in Love with God's Word, Practical Strategies for Busy Women just released as well. My book will help you if you are somebody who wants to read God's word more often, but you just struggle to get around to it, or you are someone who does read God's word, but it often feels like a chore or an obligation, something just to check off a checklist to say that you've done it. If you are someone who wants to read God's word more often and get a lot out of it, I would highly encourage you to check out my latest book, Fall in Love with God's Word, Practical Strategies for Busy Women. But first, let's talk to Sheila Ray Gregoire about her latest book, The Great Sex Rescue. All right, Sheila, I'm so excited to get to talk to you today about your latest book, The Great Sex Rescue. Before we dive into all of the things, though, will you start by just telling us a little bit about who you are, what you do online, and kind of your family, whatever we should know as we start this discussion today? Sure. Well, first of all, Brittany, it's so fun to talk to you because I feel like we've been in the same space for like a decade. And (laughs) and so it's really neat to actually join you on this. That's wonderful. Um, So I have been blogging at tolovehonorandvacuum.com since 2008. I started out mostly to just talking about parenting and marriage and housework. And then the more I talked about sex, the more my traffic grew and I became kind of the sex person. So I, I wrote the good girl's guide to great sex in 2012. Um, I've had, I wrote 31 days to great sex. And then over the years, as I've been talking about sex, I've realized that the same problems keep coming up in no matter how much healthy stuff I put out there, there's, there's something fundamentally wrong going on below the surface. And so that's what we're trying to do with this book is identify why are things so weird for a lot of people and what, what went wrong in the foundation and how can we address that foundation and build it back up right to what God really intended. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I really do send so many people your way. Anytime that people email me and they have a question about, hey, something with my sex life, I'm like, I know exactly who you need to talk to. She is like the Christian sex lady. You have so (laughs) many articles and great books. So I always, I'm like, I'm not even going to tackle this because this is the person you need to go talk to. And I just love how you take this topic that can be so taboo and you just talk about it in like a really fun big sister way where we're not going to be shameful about it. We're not going to be all taboo or weird. We're just like, hey, this is what you need to know from one girlfriend to another. So I love that about your site. Um, A while back, you did a very large survey which I sent out to the Equipping Godly Women audience. They may remember if they've been around for a while, they took part in this survey. So will you give us an update? What were the results from the survey? What did you find? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I think you were the one who sent those people of everyone who was sending out. So you really, you really plugged this. I so appreciate it. And to everyone who sat through that long, I know it was a long survey. It was like over 130 questions for most people. So thank you, you guys rock stars. Um, But what we were trying to measure specifically 
was, are there certain teachings that are really prevalent in evangelical circles that end up affecting women's sex lives and marriages later? And specifically, we were looking at, at, do they hurt women's orgasm rates? Do they cause more sexual pain? Or do they hurt marital satisfaction? And so we measured a whole ton of different teachings. And not all of them had any statistical significance. But we found a few that we identified as being the reason that people often struggle in this area. There were a few things that we are constantly taught in evangelical circles that tend to wreck sex for women. And so our hope and prayer is that we can just change this conversation <laughs> so that we can get a more healthy and what I think is really a more biblical view of sex um, more prevalent in our churches. Absolutely. I grew up in an evangelical church as well. I actually grew up in a very small church that was very legalistic. And we were absolutely mm -hmm. taught, you know, six foot rule, you stay away from the boys, the boys only want one thing, it's the girl's job to say no, no, no. And I grew up with mm -hmm. all of these messages. So I, as soon as you started talking about this, I was like, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. But for anybody who is listening yeah. today, maybe they didn't grow up in the church, maybe they grew up in a church that wasn't teaching some of these things. Can you just mm -hmm. lay the foundation? What are some of the threads that you've seen, the sh perspectives that the church has traditionally shared in the past that are causing issues today? Well, actually, you mentioned one of them. So good for you. You already identified one of our four biggies just in what you just said. And that's the idea that boys are going to want to push girls' sexual boundaries. So when teenage girls believe that, that boys are going to want to push your sexual boundaries, then when they're married, their orgasm rates go down. They're far more likely to have sex only because they think he needs it. They don't enjoy sex. Um, they, they're less likely to feel heard during conflict, interestingly enough, like far less likely to feel heard during conflict. All kinds of bad things. Um, it's high, it's it's it causes more um, incidences of sexual pain or vaginismus among women, and so we're trying to figure out. Okay, what is it about that particular message that's so bad? So we we did a lot of focused groups with women afterwards, and here's what often happens. I find this really fascinating. Let's say you're 17 years old, and you're with your boyfriend, and you start making out. Okay. What's going on in his head is something like, this is really fun. This feels great. I'm really enjoying this. But what's going on in her head is, should I stop it yet? Should I stop it yet? Is he getting too excited? I better listen to how he's breathing. Is he getting too excited? Maybe I should stop it now. What about now? And so she's not really there. She's not able to enjoy it or whatever, because she feels like I am the gatekeeper. And of course, we know that there is some, you know, truth, we all should be protecting ourselves or whatever. But there's something unique about putting it only on girls, which is what's often been done. And a couple of women described it to us like, they felt like they were always spectatoring you know, like they were outside their bodies watching what was going on and judging what was going on and trying to, and, and, and just trying to figure out when to stop. And so then when they got married, they were so used to being outside of their bodies that they weren't able to inhabit their bodies. And so they had never learned how to feel aroused. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make any comment on whether we should, you know, encourage teenagers to feel aroused because I very much believe in an orthodox biblical sexual ethic that sex is meant for marriage. But there is an element of this that, that can really hurt girls when we always feel like I have to always be the one who isn't letting myself go. I have to keep, I have to keep control of myself because I'm the one who's the breaks. And when you get used to always being the one who's in control, it's very hard to let go of control. <laughs> and then you're just not going to be able to enjoy things, you know? Plus, there's also a lot of other things that go along with that message about how it can um, uh, make date rape seem like it wasn't really date rape because it was your fault. You should have been able to stop it and all kinds of other toxic messages like that. But this is something which really does affect how women see it. It also means that all women are able to identify red flags and bad guys. You know, like if a bad guy is really pushing your sexual boundaries, you think, well, all guys do that. And you don't recognize maybe this isn't a good guy and maybe I should let him go. Yeah, I love that. And that just as I was hearing this from you, because I've read, you know, your blog posts and your books and such before, so many things were like, yes, that makes total sense. Will you share with us some of the other negative messages that are very prevalent in our culture over the last 
however long it's been? Yeah, there's a couple of them that are, that are especially bad. Um, one of them is all men struggle with lust. It's every man's battle. Uh, a lot of women agreed with that. And interesting, we just finished a survey of men. This isn't in the book, um, but it has even worse effects on men if they believe it than it has on women. So this is a really toxic message for both. Um, but when you believe that all men struggle with lust, again, you see far lower rates of orgasm, far higher rates of only having sex because he needs it. It's not something that I want to do. And, um, you know, it's even combined in, in a not so negative way with other messages. Like the idea that all men lust is every man's battle kind of goes along with the idea that men are visually stimulated and women aren't that men want sex and women don't. And when you constantly tell women and girls, men want sex, sex is a male thing. Um, every, uh, Emerson Egrich in Love and Respect phrases it this way. If your husband is typical, he has a need that you don't have. If you tell women their whole lives, you don't need sex, you don't want sex, you aren't attracted to good looking men, um, their bodies do nothing for you, <laughs> you know, you never are going to lust. Is it any surprise if women don't want sex? <laughs> like, like we spend our whole lives telling women you don't want this. So there's the, there's the toxic side of it where we expect that men are going to objectify us, where we expect that men are going to lust and women who believe that are far less likely to be able to trust their husbands and, and all sorts of that. But then there's the not so toxic, but still really harmful idea that women just are sexual. And that's actually not true. You know, interestingly, what we found was that, um, in about 60% of marriages, he has the higher sex drive, but in 20% of marriages, they have roughly the equivalent. And then in about 20% of marriages, she has the higher sex drive. But when women believe the every man's battle message, they're far more likely to be in marriages where he has the higher sex drive rather than in marriages where their sex drive is shared. That makes sense. And I've seen that a lot in my own life as well. Just growing up in the church, being taught sex is bad, sex is bad. Like, don't do this, say no, stay away. It's for him. Mm -hmm. And once I got married, I'm like, okay, now I'm married. How do I flip the switch to now? This is a good thing. And I'm supposed mm -hmm. to enjoy and relax. And like, this isn't what I've been taught my entire life. So I can absolutely yeah. see how those um, messages would get into the church. I know that you speak out specifically about several books. Um, I don't know if you want to name names of things that you've said that, you know, these books specifically are harmful, but how can we know if we are reading Christian books today about sex and marriage, what things should we be looking for that we could say, okay, this is a good resource and I should take its advice or, okay, I'm reading this book, but something's off here. How do we mm -hmm. pick up on those signals? Well, um, I'm glad you asked that, Brittany, <laughs> but, but what we did with our, with our um, book is we did the survey of 20,000 women and we identified which teachings were most harmful. And then we looked at a lot of peer reviewed research, research that's out in the academic world about women's sexuality. And so we identified all kinds of markers of healthy sex messages. And then we created a 12 point rubric. So with 12 different questions of healthy sexuality, and we, we rated things on a zero to four. So we have a scorecard of like, like what constitutes a zero, what's a one, what's a two, what's a three, what's a four. And if you want to see that, you can download it. I will give you the link and you can put it in your, your podcast um, description so people can click through, but you can download that rubric and the scorecard and see how different books scored. There were a lot of books that actually scored quite well. We what we did was we took the 10 best-selling Christian marriage books. Um, three of them didn't talk about sex, so we excluded them. So we did those seven, and then we took six um, of the best-selling sex books over the decades because we wanted to look at, at the formative sex books, not just the ones that have sold well now, but also the ones that sold really well when pastors were getting married because this is what our pastors learned about sex. <laughs> so we looked at those books. And we rated them on our rubric and a couple of books did really well, you know, gift of sex by the penners scored like 47 out of 48. Um, intimate issues scored like 41 out of 48, I believe boundaries in marriage, sacred marriage, those scored really well, but then there were some books that did very, very poorly. Um, and often the things that the books tended to score badly on were blaming women for men's porn use and blaming women for men's affairs. 
um, and also making sex almost entirely about him, like saying that he's the one with the libido. He, you know, you need to have sex so that he'll be satisfied and never giving women the chance to decide whether they really wanted to have sex or not. And so some of those really bad ones, like love and respect was the worst. Every man's battle was very bad. His needs, her needs for women only, however, praying wife, all of those scored very low. Mm -hmm. And those are the exact books that I read right around the age that I was getting ready to get married or like, those are like, that's the list. That's what I read. Like, did you look at my library card? Those are the ones. Um, but <laughs> I am wondering, is it possible that, okay, these books scored very low and I'm not debating you on that at all, but is it possible for people to read some of these books or books like them and for it not to affect them in a negative way? So for example, Love and Respect, you said it was the one that scored the lowest. It's been like a decade probably since I read it, but I read it twice because I found that it was very helpful in terms of some of the messaging it gave around here is how to respect a husband because my husband and I came from both very traditional backgrounds and I didn't know like, what does, you know, what does it look like to respect a husband? So I feel like it did give me mm -hmm. some helpful information of, okay, here's what he's probably looking for. And I probably just overlooked some of the messaging that I didn't know to overlook. So mm -hmm. is it possible that some of these books, while they do score low in these areas can still be helpful as long as we're keeping in mind some of these perspectives to avoid? Um, you know, <sighs> There are a lot of books that if people read them, they didn't necessarily hurt them. Absolutely for sure. And because people might have protective factors, you know, you might have, even, even if you read this, you might have a, a really good marriage where your husband is a really, really giving guy. And so it's not going to hurt you. But if your sister were to read that book and her husband felt really entitled to sex um, and her husband didn't treat her well, that book would have a very different outcome for her. And so that's why I really want us to get into the habit of recommending books that are not harmful because books should not be harmful. One of the saddest parts actually of doing our research was we looked at the top selling secular marriage book, um, John Gottman's The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. It scored 47 out of 48. The best-selling book that we looked at, which was in the Christian world, was Love and Respect, and it scored the worst. It's, it, it literally scored zero out of 48. Um, and that broke my heart that the secular world is actually doing healthy sexual messages. And I'm not, when, I'm, when I'm saying healthy sexual messages, I'm not talking about weird liberal stuff. I'm talking just about normal things like, <laughs> you know, does the book talk about the benefits of sex being more than just for his physical release, but does it also mention intimacy and feeling close and growing love like that? That's an example of a healthy sexual message, you know, and, and so many, when they talked about sex, they only talked about it in terms of his physical release. And so I think that when we look at, at a lot of these books, there are some that did really well. And what I hope is that we'll start recommending the books that did really well. Um, not, and, and it goes beyond sex too, but for other marriage um, reasons as well. We, we did do an open-ended question where we asked women, were there any marriage resources, ministries, books, et cetera, that helped your marriage? And also, were there any that hurt your marriage? And Love and Respect was the number one book that was mentioned that harmed marriage. Um, and there were others too, Every Man's Battle, uh, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, Created to Be His Help Meet, and what was number five? Oh, Focus on the Family was number five. So, you know, those were the top five. And the reason people chose Focus on the Family was largely because it was recommending the other resources. Um, at least that's what people said, but then the, the helpful ones, you know, were, were books that tended to score quite well. And so I, I just hope that when we're recommending resources, we might realize that even if we found a book helpful, because a lot of people found love and respect helpful, it wasn't like, it might've been the most harmful, but it was also helpful to some, we don't know what other people's marriages are like when we recommend it. And it, it, it is the one that, um, the majority of people who complained about it said that it enabled abuse in their marriage and, and marital rape. And that was very hard to hear. Yeah. And I think that's an, a very important distinction. And I'm glad that you brought up how it can affect different people different ways, because in mm -hmm. my marriage, my husband is amazing and he's very generous mm -hmm. and kind and loving, like everything you could ever want from a husband. Yeah. So it mm -hmm. didn't affect 
our marriage in that way because I had this great husband who was trying to also make sure that I was happy as well. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want anyone to listen to this and say, okay, well, I read this book and I thought it was amazing. So Sheila just must not know what she's talking about. No. Okay. There are messages in these books that maybe even if it didn't affect you that way, maybe it could affect other people. So just being aware of that, I think is really Mm -hmm. helpful as well. Um, I want to ask you, because some of the messages that we tell, I mean, I'm not old enough to have teenagers. My little girl is still a little girl. Um, But as our kids grow into the preteen and teenage years, I know that we are going to want to give them some messages of, hey, like, don't go and have sex with the whole baseball team or, you know, whatever that looks like (laughs) for the family. But how can we then um, give them these messages? Because we do want our girls and our boys to be safe and make wise biblical choices. Mm -hmm. Do you have any language or advice around how we can have these conversations with our girls and our boys without giving them this message that sex is bad or it's all your job to make sure nothing happens or boys always have to lust how do we have these conversations then yeah that's a great that's a great question and it's a big part of our book so in our book what we do is we identify all these health all these unhealthy messages we show why they're unhealthy we show where a lot of these messages came from so it's filled with quotes from like sheet music um Uh, love like all these different books that said things really, really badly. Uh, But then we also have a big section on how to rescue and reframe these messages to put them back in line with what God wants. So for instance, instead of saying um, all guys lust, we can say people lust, some people lust, but some people don't. (laughs) And if you're struggling with lust, that's okay. It's a common struggle, but please know that it is a struggle that you can overcome through the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not alone in this. Many people have overcome it. And we can just say it like that. You know, it doesn't need to be a all boys lust. It really should be not gender specific. I don't, we could say, you know, many people struggle with lust and a lot of girls, a lot of boys struggle with it more than girls do, but some girls do as well. But, you know, it just needs to be a far more nuanced message that gives the whole picture and that always points back to Jesus as the answer for it. Because I find a lot of these these messages point out struggles that men have and then require girls to fix them instead of pointing back to Jesus. And that's a big problem. So one of the other um, big uh, big problems that we have is... uh, If you have sex, you will help your husband not watch pornography, right? So sex will will stop him from watching porn. And every man's battle literally calls women methadone for their husband's sex addictions. Like it says, you can be a merciful vial of methadone for him when his temperature is rising. I mean, that is just so dehumanizing and disgusting. Because what it's essentially saying is what he really wants is to watch porn and look at that hot girl but he'll settle for you and you can keep him going so that he, he can get away with not having what he actually really wants. That sounds exciting. Yay. Like I would know. Yeah. Like that's disgusting. Right. But you know, that's the kind of message that we give. Now, what we could say instead is pornography ensnares a lot of people, you know, boys more than girls, but it does, but it does ensnare girls too. The problem with porn is that it's not a victimless crime. Those are real people. And porn is the biggest driver of sex trafficking. And when you watch porn, you are hurting real people who are being abused. You're also missing out on what sex is. You are turning sex into something which is selfish and self-focused and you're losing the, what sex, how sex is supposed to be intimate. And so you do need to quit porn. We know that's difficult. We're going to help you do that. But please know that many people have gotten over this. It does not have to be a lifelong struggle. <laughs> and, um, and even if you're drawn to porn, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to suck, get sucked in. And even though a lot of people watch porn, not everybody does. And so, you know, don't feel like you, like you need to. You know, one of the stories we shared in the book is um, I'm very close to a, a young man in his 20s. And he's just a great guy, loves his mom, has like, is very respectful, just a wonderful all around great guy. And when he was in youth group, he treated women well, he treated girls well, he was the one who was always protecting them from weird, strange guys. But every time he went to youth group, the message was always don't watch porn. We know you're going to watch porn, don't watch porn. And so by the time he was 17, he was starting to feel like he wasn't a real man because he wasn't drawn to porn. And so he started watching porn so that he could feel like a real man. 
And he never would have done that had youth group had a better message. Had they not been saying all guys struggle with porn, if they had just been saying some people struggle with porn, Jesus is bigger than porn, don't watch porn because it's involved in sex trafficking. <laughs> you know. And so two years later, he found it was really affecting how he saw the women around him and he quit again and he's been free ever since. But, you know, there's an example of the way that we talk about stuff hurts both men and women. And we need to get back to putting Jesus at the center instead of focusing on the sin at the center. Okay, so I want to ask you this. If there's a woman who is listening today and she's saying, okay, I, my sex life is not where it needs to be. My marriage, something is off. How does she know if it is a matter of she's heard these messages her whole life or her husband grew up in church and he heard these messages and that's what's causing the problem or if it's just normal what happens in marriage because every marriage is going to have some level mm -hmm. of sex sexual difficulty every marriage is going to have some kind of conflict how does she know okay this is the problem well i think if you have a really low libido or you have a trouble or you have trouble reaching orgasm and you don't know why um you know it's not that you necessarily have a bad marriage or something you just don't know why reading this book can be really eye-opening and what what a lot of people have told us is oh my gosh i finally feel heard like i feel so seen i feel so validated and that's what we want from this is for women to read it and feel like okay i'm not crazy like this really was a weird thing that i went through and I learned so much, like even, even reading through the survey results, I've changed a lot of the ways I talk about things. I learned a lot more about why I had a terrible honeymoon that I had never seen before. Even just looking as, as I looked closer at the books that I read before I got married and I saw how that set me up to fail. It explained so much and it was actually really freeing. And I've been talking about sex for decades, you know, and it, and, and I learned something from this. So I think it's really a good process to go through, to look at how the culture in which we grew up, if you grew up in evangelicalism has affected us because a lot of us, it has, and some a lot more than others. Um, but, but a lot of us, it has, and, and the book is something which you can read either alone or with your husband. And there's a lot of exercises at the end of the book to try to overcome a lot of these barriers and just start having fun again. And so I hope that it is a really healing book for people. Well, thank you so much for all of your research. I know you must have taken forever to do all of this research and compile to write such an incredible resource for us. Everything that I have seen so far has just been fascinating and eye-opening to realize, oh yeah, I was taught that as a child. I didn't question it then, but now I can see what's happening because of that. So thank you so much for your book and for your time today. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share as we close up for today? Well, I one thing we I, I didn't mention, and I just really have a heart for women like this because this was me, is one of the big things we were looking at was sexual pain. Um, a lot of women, we found 32% of women over the course of their marriage suffer sexual pain at some point. Some of that is postpartum and some of that is primary pain and some women get blessed with both. <laughs> Um, you know, and about 7% have pain so, so much that penetration is impossible. And what it, we found that Christian women are actually twice the rate of the secular population. That's, that's long been known. And so I just want to say that was my story. Um, and so doing this was, was healing for myself as well, because I had that too. And finding out why was so interesting. And so just know if you're feeling this, the word is vaginismus. A lot of people don't even know there's a word for it, but you're not alone. And I know 7% of your listeners are like that. So you're not alone and there is help and there is hope. Well, thank you so much, Sheila. It's great to be here and it's great to see you, Brittany. It's fun to actually see you in person. So <laughs> you too. All right, so that just about does it for today's podcast episode. If you found today's talk with Sheila to be so fascinating, like I did, I would highly encourage you to go check out her brand new book that just released into the world. It is called The Great Sex Rescue, The Lies You've Been Taught and How to Recover What God Intended. Whether you grew up in the evangelical purity culture yourself and know exactly what she's talking about, or you just want to learn more about why so many marriages are the way that they are today and how this has played a part in that, this book is a fantastic resource. I really hope you'll check it out.
And secondly, if you haven't seen my new book, Fall in Love with God's Word, Practical Strategies for Busy Women, I hope you will check that out too. You can find more about both books in the show notes of today's podcast episode. And finally, as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet, what are you waiting for? We come back here on a regular basis to have interesting conversations about everything, faith, marriage, parenting, anything that you need to know to help you be all in as a Christian woman. So go ahead subscribe and I hope to see you back here real soon. All right, bye!